I'm Ed. Hi, I'm Hugh, and welcome back to our series on restoring Chris Buck's uh, 1962 Fender Stratocaster. This is part three, and I know you've been quite worried about this one, haven't you? Ah, not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's um, the finger board is a nightmare. Fretting it was actually pretty easy. Oh, good. good Thankfully. Good. So uh, you've got yeah. those old Hofner frets out then, and all... <laughs> the Hofner frets almost fell out. You know, yeah, <laughs> they're just. Uh, the, the 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 ones that were stuck in it was really funny because uh, with there were at the top of the board the original Fender frets were still there and usually you can just tap them out the side and they come out mm. really really easily but I don't know if people have put someone have put glue in there certainly there was like varnish build up on the sides and those mm. things were just not going to tap out at all so um, oh it, through gritted teeth I actually had to kind of pull them out and I hate doing that with vintage fenders. But they came out pretty clean, and since all the frets have come out, been pulled out rather than tapped out from the sides, I'm actually going to be fretting this guitar by tapping and pressing the frets in from the top rather than coming in from the side, which is different to the way I did your I 64 strats. I was going to say, yeah, because the old way Fender used to do it was from the side, wasn't it? And it's quite unusual to yeah. see people doing that nowadays. Yeah, so... so as I understand it, the the kind of cutoff point when when Fender stopped putting frets in from the side was around about 1982. Some people call it mid 80s, but mm -hmm. certainly from the mid 80s onwards, that they they became more conventional in the way they did it. But um, they went in from the side. So if you're taking vintage Fender frets out or pre 85 mm -hmm. Fender frets, they should probably be tapped out from the side. And if you're going to do the job. It, you know, as vintage correct as possible. As you, can, you can actually as possible, yeah, you yeah. can actually tap them in from the sides too, which is yes. like I said, what yeah, I did yeah. with with your vintage Strat. And it was lucky, perhaps, with mine. The board was in a better condition, and they came out relatively well and went straight back in. And they look fantastic. You're far less sort of yeah. damage to the board. The thing is, you are yanking things out and bashing them in again, which sometimes you have to do. Obviously, in a case like this one, there's, mm. there's been damage before and stuff. But yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But actually, doing that though. Um, putting the fret wire in it has to be fret wire that's pretty much identical to uh, the fret wire that was used Vintage, yeah, yeah, initially yeah, yeah. Um, so in a sense not being able to do that just kind of free things up for mm. Chris to choose the wire that he actually wanted so yeah. as, as he mentioned in his video quite recently he came over to my place and we got a, I got a whole bunch of vintage strats in for him to try out, one of which was Ed's and one of mine, well, a couple of mine and, and uh, our mate Simon's as well. Yeah. Yeah. And he just basically went through all these guitars and kind of settled on the fret wire that he, he liked the most. Um, and, and that's and the that best way by feel and by playing it, isn't it? Because there's all these myths and rumours of so-and-so player used this wire and this wire and yeah. so on and just... Choose the wire that you like most, really, is the best. Absolutely. If you're lucky enough, like Chris was, to have his hands on a whole bunch of them, compare them, yeah. then choose the one you like, you know. And don't ever feel pressured into into thinking that you have to have jumbo frets on a vintage strap because mm. Stevie Ray Vaughan did, and you have big frets and you have big to big tone because it's just, it's absolute nonsense. Um, if, you, if you want jumbo frets because you like the feel of jumbo frets, then it's a perfectly valid choice. But if, you, if, you, if you're doing it just because you know, mm. somebody told you it's a good idea, um, try and play a strat with that type of fret wire in first and try a few different types. So the wire that we, we Chris actually chose in the end is, is the same wire that I've got on my red strat, which is a 63, which is actually relatively narrow. I mean, it's pretty close mm. to, to vintage spec, yeah. but it's really quite tall. Um, which is nice actually because it enables you to get under the strings and get a lot more control of the vibrato when you're bending. Yep. The other important aspect for me is that because this is a veneer board, the last thing I want to do is over sand the board because you haven't exactly got a lot of wood to play with. Yes, so um, by just getting the board looking good, being fairly flat but maybe not engineering flat, um, 
with the taller fret wire, I can get the level that I need by taking the frets. taking the metal off rather than taking wood off. And I would rather do it that way around. Definitely, yeah. I mean, Chris would sound good playing a plank with frets on, wouldn't he? Let's be honest. Yeah, I'm afraid but, he would, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's great. Hopefully it'll feel and he'll really bond with this guitar. And it's, yeah, looking forward to seeing it. Absolutely. So in this episode, you're going to see some frets going in, uh, a little bit on fret beveling, fret leveling and a little bit of a kind of roundup at the end when uh, we'll have a look at how the job came out and how the fingerboard looks now that the frets are in and uh, hope you enjoy. The frets are finally in. Um, the installation went pretty well. I'm quite pleased. Uh, everything's seated uh, nicely and when I sight along it um, this one's maybe a little bit high, but all the rest are pretty level. Um, the fingerboard is looking good. I'm, I'm really pleased with the way that, that that has turned out. And I need to clean up a few little areas where I've just done some rosewood dust and super glue uh, patches to just clean things up a little bit, but that's not going to be very much work. So the next thing I have to do is to use uh, this thing here, which is a special tool I use for um, beveling the fret ends and also it has this section here, which enables me to get a square edge all along the edge of the board. So this came from a guy on eBay, it wasn't particularly expensive and I lost count of the number of uh, refrets I've done with this. What I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to run some masking tape along here. The reason being that when you're filing the frets, you get a lot of uh, metal dust and it can become embedded in the fingerboard, but it also cause the top of the frets to scratch. And there's no reason to do that because you end up then having to do far more work later on when you're leveling and uh, crowning and polishing the frets. So I, if I protect this whole area with masking tape, then after the ends of the frets are done and the tape is removed, the board and the tops of the frets here should look pristine. This doesn't take an awful lot of time. Okay, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use a little bit of kitchen paper as a pad. I'm going to just wrap this around the top of the headstock. This is just a precaution really because I get it behind the nut area and the reason for this is that it's so easy to just to overshoot when you're using the beveling tool and come crashing against the uh, the ends of the the, uh, the curve of the headstock here. Um, it's not so much of a problem with uh, fenders, but with some guitars, you've got to be really, really careful. Anyway, it takes two seconds just to add a little bit of extra protection there. Note that I'm actually taping over the, the paper, the kitchen paper rather than the actual lacquer, and certainly don't want to get any masking tape stuck on the decal because this is pretty delicate and I think it would probably come off off uh, with alarming ease. So there we go, just add some more I think to the outside edge. One thing I don't like about the tool that I use is that if you're not careful with it, it has a tendency to tip and if it tips then it's all too easy to um, gouge into the side of the neck with the abrasive and I don't want that to happen to this beautiful guitar so almost done okay and we're good to go uh, I don't actually like doing this very much. I've never liked this part of fret work. 
I don't know why. I think the, the main thing really is to work as slowly as possible and keep a very, very close eye. Especially with vintage necks like this, not so much because of the value, but because having been played a lot and maybe had uh, refrets in the past, there's no guarantee that the edge of this um, fretboard is actually straight. So you can end up um, cutting into the wood in some areas and still have um, fret wire proud of the edge in others. Um, sometimes you almost have to do them on a fret by fret basis uh, if you don't want to uh, do much, uh, do any damage to the neck. So it's a question of patience and care and diligence and hopefully within a fairly short period of time this is going to look and feel an awful lot better. See you shortly. Okay, so here we are 45 minutes later and one side is done. I've gone over it with uh, some fine abrasive paper as well, just to give it a little bit of a polish up. But uh, those frets are looking pretty good, I think. They need to be rounded off a little bit just to make them feel even smoother. But uh, that's looking pretty good. It's kind of tricky because between almost all of the frets there's a there's a rollover, quite a dramatic rollover that uh, has caused a curve inwards towards the center of the board but of course because the area where the frets are, because it's metal, that's prevented those areas from wearing. So the edge of the fingerboard is not straight. The frets are ready for leveling. I've uh, protected the fingerboard uh, by putting masking tape between all the frets and I put them a lot I put the, the tape along the sides first and then the tape that's going across the fingerboard uh, sits on first layer of tape which makes it really easy and quick to take everything off afterwards. Um, the tops of the, all the frets have been marked with a uh, black marker pen and the reason for that is uh, it's very very easy to see then when you're leveling the frets which ones have been touched by the leveling beam and which ones haven't. At the end of it I don't want to see any black marks on the top of the frets at all so that as soon as all the black marks have disappeared it's the end of the leveling process and it's time for crowning and polishing so we're ready to go and see you in a sec this is my uh, leveling beam by the way which uh, is just like uh, something I got from my local metal merchant uh, you can spend a lot of money for one of these um, from Stumac or any of the other big luthier places but this is perfectly flat and it cost me about three pounds so pretty cheap so double sided tape on the, on the flat edge um, I've got 320 grit paper on here um, I think a lot of people tend to go, go with a coarser abrasive but uh, I prefer uh, something a little gentler because the scratches don't go so deep into the tops of the frets and it makes um, polishing and smoothing the frets later on a lot easier. So let's give it a shot. And it's done. There's a little bit more variation on the amount of flatness on the top of the frets that I'm accustomed to. Uh, but in large part that was because um, I put very tall frets on here um, with a view to getting the level by taking uh, material off the frets rather than trying to over sand the fingerboard. So that's par for the course, it means a little bit more work with the crowning. But by and large I'm quite pleased with this. 
so crowning next and polishing and we should have a playable neck very soon. Clearly we've uh, glossed over a lot of the details because this was never intended to be a uh, guide on how to refret a vintage guitar. Plenty of videos like that on YouTube and if enough of you want to see one of those we'd be happy to do one. But we finally get to see the board finished and all the frets crowned and polished. Some lemon oil has been applied to bring out the dark rosewood colour and also you can see a lovely chocolatey brown area just above the 12th fret. I'm not going to be cleaning off the dots because, well, let's face it, Chris doesn't really need them and he always seems to play with his eyes closed anyway. So you were fretting about that job quite a lot, um, but actually it turned out okay. <laughs> well, anyway, I wasn't fretting that much really. <laughs> it's the board that was giving me nightmares. But yeah, I think it's turned out really well. I'm pleased with it. I know Chris is pleased with it. So I think we've got the basis now of a guitar that's actually going to play really well. And time to move on to the next phase of the project. Brilliant. Please uh, stay tuned for episode four. The next one's coming up, looking at a few sort of finish issues on the neck. Um, please hit subscribe, guys. Leave us any comments. Any information, uh, any sort of stories you've got of refretting old guitars and so on, we'd love to hear them. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Yeah, so as Ed said, we're going to be cleaning up the finish. And we're also going to be uh, learning how to do, to do uh, refurb work on vintage Cluson tuners. Very useful, actually. Brilliant. Okay, Hoi thanks very much. Dabo.